private individuals and foundations. Uh, we've gotten into something that is so much larger than we ever anticipated, and we would truly be in over our heads without the help from these individuals that we've received uh, very willingly and very helpfully. So thank you, thank you all. Now, uh, moving, uh, uh, <laughs> me a little advanced problem here. Okay, moving forward again. Uh, current excavations by the University of Cincinnati at the Palace of Nestor began in 2015 and are still continuing. And they began following a Greek European co-funded program to improve present, uh, presentation of the palace itself, a project in which we had the honor of collaborating with the Ministry of Culture and Sports and the Aphoria of Antiquities in, in column. In, oh, what, what's the advanced problem? Um, and, uh, Okay, to put a, a project to erect a new roof over the main building of the Palace of Nestor. So if you haven't been there recently, it's an entirely different experience today than you remember with the old Dexion roofing that was installed in 1960s. Uh, the, the visit to the Palace of Nestor now gives you an entirely new view of the immenseness and the expansiveness and the overall shape of the structure. Uh, 75 years after Carl Blagan and Costandinos Curoniotis discovered the Palace of Nestor, our aim more recently was to investigate the town around the citadel. Although we did find remains relevant to the settlement history of the site from the uh, early Middle Hellatic period through the Mycenaean period, what was entirely unanticipated was our discovery of new monuments belonging to the mortuary landscape of Pelos. Um, thus the uh, semi-jocular title of our presentation in honor of Michael Ventress this afternoon, Tales from the Crypt. Several years ago, we reported the excavation of the grave of the Griffin warrior in an olive grove where John Camp at last dug on behalf of Blagan uh, in uh, the later 1960s and had found uh, no, very little. We related how we found the grave in May 2015 on the first day of our new excavations. And we briefly described the grave in an introduction to a detailed presentation of four gold rings found in it. Excavations have since continued in that olive grove on the Acropolis of the Palace of Nestor, and notably also in a newly acquired field to the northeast, where in 2018, we discovered two previously unknown Mycenaean tombs, Tholos tombs, also on the first day of excavation. The organization of our presentation this afternoon will be as follows. First, I will talk about the grave of the Griffin warrior how we now understand this burial, how we interpret the history of the monument. In so doing, we're giving you a preview of our fourth preliminary report about the grave, which should be published in Hesperia at some point within 2022. In the second part of our presentation, Sherry will turn to the new Tholos tombs. Our strategy for documenting the grave of the Griffin warrior is to publish comprehensive studies when ready, rather than wait until a fully integrated and complete book length manuscript is prepared. Uh, our, uh, oh, I'm one slide off. Uh, the grave of the Griffin warrior you see relative to the palace of Nestor and Tholos tomb four and the new Tholos tombs. Uh, in co our contributions to our contributions to Hesperia thus far, uh, our focus has been on spectacular finds, the Pelos combat agate and a gold necklace in addition to the gold rings. 
Our fourth report is a collaborative effort with two geoarchaeologists, Caleb McNamee and Takis Karkanas, and an expert in pottery analysis at the University of Pisa, Salvatore Vitale. The result of such teamwork is that the life history of the grave of the Griffin warrior can now be traced in greater detail than has generally been possible in publications of mortuary remains. The sequence of events is relatively clear at this point. Our reconstructed history of the grave is based on architectural, stratigraphical, and geoarchaeological information in addition to quantitative ceramic analysis. A particular importance is the fact that the burial deposit was sealed very soon after the funeral of the Griffin warrior. And that makes this context an especially important chronological uh, linchpin in typologies of the many classes of artifacts represented among its hundreds of individual finds. We can in fact conclusively document the date of the interment as late Helladic 2A. Although there were no complete ceramic vessels among the grave goods, the time of the burial can be determined by stylistic dates for pot shirts recovered in several contemporary contexts. More on this later. The grave of the Griffin warrior, the grave of the Griffin warrior is significantly different from the best known shaft graves of the Argolid at Mycenae and Lerna. It is smaller than most at Mycenae and unlike them, it was only used once. It also lacks built or rock cut ledges on which wooden beams would have been rested in order to separate the burial chamber from earth in the shaft above. Wooden beams would not have been necessary in this grave because the shaft of the grave was not intentionally filled with earth after deposition of the corpse. There are similarities, however, between the grave of the Griffin warrior and a plundered shaft grave found by Blagan's team under the Northeast building on the Acropolis of Pilos in 1957, and the few finds recovered from it are of similar character, such as this uh, amazing gold bead, as never, I think, before been really properly uh, uh, illustrated, doing it justice. The Back to our grave. The uh, entire burial deposit in the grave had been compressed into a compact layer only about 45 centimeters deep. And it was a volume, constituted a volume of roughly only a cubic meter. Uh, a matrix of rock hard soil that included the remains of the coffin, grave goods, and the extended burial of a single adult male. His gender recently confirmed by uh, ADNA analysis at Harvard. Uh, he was 30 to 35 years old. The skeleton preserved no obvious indications of the cause of death. Clearing this uh, modest deposit of only a, a one cubic meter required five months because of its extreme compression. After the walls of the grave were built, a thin layer of reddish brown earth uh, containing small bits of charcoal was laid inside on top of the parent material at the bottom of the shaft. And the coffin was set on this cultural fill, the body of the Griffin warrior lying inside it with most of the more precious grave goods. At some point, At some point, uh, this is item G on this illustration, uh, the uh, earth was added to the spaces between the sides of the coffin and the walls of the grave, creating earthen banks. Uh, looking now at H on this diagram, the open coffin was eventually covered with wooden planks 
and additional grave goods of bronze and ivory textiles uh, and boar's tusk uh, from a helmet and a suit of armor were set on top of the planks. Uh, here you see uh, one of the first indications of a plank that we discovered in the course of excavating the grave. The top of the grave shaft was covered by stone slabs, probably four in total, laid across its short dimension, their ends resting on the northeastern and southwestern walls. We found only one slab, that which would have covered the southeastern side of the grave. One end of it was embedded in the floor of the grave, you'll see in a moment. We presume that the slabs had been covered with a low mound of earth as George Milonas thought had been the case for grave circle B at Mycenae. The contents of the grave would otherwise have been open to looting and the body of the Griffin warrior exposed to the predations of carnivores. The existence of a mound also explains how the shaft was rapidly infilled with earth containing fragments of late Hellatic 2A pottery. Uh, soon after the burial, the cover slab that we found had fractured into two pieces, as you see in item B. Uh, it fractured near its southwestern edge and its fragments fell into the grave. The larger fragment pivoted uh, here in item D on the northeastern wall its southwestern end ultimately crashing through the bottom of the coffin and E, after embedding itself in the floor, the slab then immediately began to lean toward the southwestern wall. In the process, compressing one side of the coffin and grave goods until as you see here in F, it finally reached a position of stability before reaching the southwestern side of the grave. It was then that we imagined that earth from the mound covering the slabs began to slump into the grave, unevenly and incompletely filling the shaft. At the same time, parts of the upper courses of the southwestern wall collapsed into the interior of the grave. Now, stratigraphy supports our assertion that the burial and goods accompanying it lay undisturbed until we excavated in 2015. We removed the first 20 centimeters of earth from the shaft in arbitrary levels. Uh, although roots of nearby olive trees, got one slide out of order here. Uh, this is uh, the upper layer with uh, some of the uh, most elaborate uh, items that I mentioned, such as the board's teeth. Let me go ahead here. Uh, although roots of nearby olive trees extended near to the grave, its walls had miraculously not been disturbed by older or more recent planting in the surrounding grove. In the next levels, a few sherds were concentrated near the northeastern wall including a late Hellatic three kylex stem. And beneath that, there followed a silty fill with clay lenses, also with a small number of late Hellatic three uh, sherds. But all of this was above the top of the fallen stone cover slab, the arrow here pointing to the top as it was first exposed. And indeed, we had no idea what it was going to turn out to be at the time. The total depth of these upper levels was just over 60 centimeters. Some of the earth in these levels clearly on the basis of the pottery had entered the grave many years after the cover slab had broken and its fragments fell. But not a single shirt later than LH2A was found lower in the grave. And then at the bottom of level nine, we excavate, uh, reached through excavation, the burial deposit itself. Now, we took seven undisturbed blocks of sediments were removed for micromorphological analysis from soil profiles within the lower levels of the grave. And among other things of interest, 
their analysis by Takis Karkanas suggests that the cover slab fell even before the body of the Griffin warrior had fully decomposed. A large number of phosphate rich iron features found in higher units should be interpreted as resulting from corpse decomposition. Phosphorus, which is indicative, was not de detected in the marl bedrock, nor in the fill overlying the burial deposit. As for the chronology of the burial, which I said I would return to, we are more confident than ever that it occurred in late Hellenic 2A. 856 pottery fragments were brought to light from three distinct areas inside and outside the grave. The latest diagnostic pieces from the lower strata within the grave range from between late Hellenic 1 and late Hellenic 2A, as indicated by diagnostic Mycenaean lustrous decorated and fine plain fabrics. I show you some examples here in an illustration prepared by Salvatore Vitale for the fourth part of our publication. Shirts recovered by Calamagnaby in the building trenches outside the grave are of the same date. And interestingly, two quantitative comparisons of the ceramics from these deposits uh, with uh, ceramics from late Hellenic to settlement deposits that we have excavated since uh, the year 2015 also support a late Hellenic 2A date, as you can see in this diagram. So who was the Griffin warrior? Why was he singled out for such an extraordinary burial? In our several publications since the discovery, we have explored relationships between physical objects buried with him and their iconographical representations and other media included with the burial. Uh, in so doing, we have been inspired in part by the work of uh, the Griffin Warrior himself, uh, inspired by the work of Emma Killian Darrellmeyer uh, in reference to Vafio this award-winning uh, reconstruction of the appearance of the, uh, of the Griffin Warrior. In fact, has, uh, it's now actually won an award by the Royal Photographic Society of, uh, of Great Britain. We're very proud of that and uh, for its creator. Um, more recently, we published, and here's Emma uh, Killian Dermeyer's diagram of the relationship and distribution of finds from the Vafio cyst. More recently, we published two additional finds, which we believe once again demonstrate intentionality in the choice of goods included with the burial, while also suggesting that Minoan symbols were understood and actively managed by the early Mycenaean elite of Pelos. The first of the two finds, the first of the two finds is a lentoid agate seal stones with antithetic Minoan genii. Both face an altar with incurved sides, horns of consecration with a tree on top, and a 16 pointed sun symbol overhead. Look carefully. Incredibly, a fragment of the armor of the Griffin warrior, seemingly from the chest area, revealed when x rayed a gold cutout in the form of an absolutely identical sun symbol. And here's a close up of it. Uh, we still have not cleaned away the corrosion from this piece, uh, this piece of bronze armor, but the sun symbol itself and the dots between the rays uh, are very obvious in uh, this x-ray. Uh, exactly the same number of rays on the sun. This combination of military and religious imagery 
represented by objects in the grave are symbols of power and ritual that seem appropriate to us, to the office of a Wanax or a proto Wanax at a time when the state of Pelos was in the earliest stages of its formation, when emergent elite in Mycenae were drawing on my known symbols to reinforce growing inequalities of power and wealth. Today, we add another extraordinary artifact to the picture, an unparalleled piece of jewelry consisting of three crystal lenses bound together with gold bands and granulated caps at each end of hollow gold bars, which don't quite meet in the center. Uh, two sides, two of these crystal lenses are engraved with scenes that we would normally expect to find on my known seals. A nursing lion, which you see here and in this drawing on the left, and perhaps of more interest in regard to our conversation this evening, a priest carrying a Syrian fenestrated ax, similar to the representation on a seal stone from the Vafio cyst. There, Tsundas, of course, also found the actual head of a duck-billed ax and the representation on the actual uh, prismatic itself uh, and impression on the right. This exceptional artifact once again points to a ritual role for the Griffin warrior, we think, and is yet another example of exotic objects being used to build the identities of early Mycenaean elite. Sherry will discuss more such exotica when we turn to Tholos, what we call Tholos six and seven. I want to continue though and say that Tom Palima some years ago published a very important paper in which he argued that the impact of Minoan ideology on the mainlanders was so profound that the very institute of kingship was likely to have been a borrowing from Crete. Tom uh, placed that event in the later shaft grave period and wrote that the terminology directly relating to Mycenaean and later Greek kinship and kingly ideology is either non-Indo-European, Anax and Vasileus, or Greek specific, Skiptron, and went on to say that we can detect the importation and implementation of such an ideology um, within the various stages of shaft grave burials. Tom believed that the powers of the Wanax were intimately connected with and derived from his religious associations. And he argues that the Skiptron is a symbol of the divine authority held by the Wanax, stressing the significance of the staff in my known iconography. He continued, there is no compelling reason to argue essentially from a broader silence of archeological testimony that the religious artifacts of the later shaft graves had no religious or charismatic meaning for the rulers with whom they were buried. This combination of military and religious imagery represented by objects and employed in a patterned manner seems to us to point in the very direction supported uh, suggested by Palima, symbols both of power and ritual are appropriate to the office of a Wanax at a time when the state of Pelos was in the earliest stages of formation, when emergent elite in Messenia were drawing on Minoan iconography to reinforce growing inequalities of power and wealth. The Griffin warrior was clearly displayed in death as a warrior. His armor and ceremonial sword attest to that. The hilt of the sword elaborately decorated in the so-called gold embroidery technique, then 
engraved with forms of animals. Likely a lion and a quadruped. We're not quite sure yet. Yet the presence of his bull's headed staff alludes to divine authority, particularly when we consider that he was also buried with a gold ring depicting a descending goddess holding a scepter. The sun symbol on his armor marks the sky as well as the earth, as is the domain. The griffin warrior, buried also with a schlockmesser, as Schliemann called them, was one who performs blood sacrifices, as did my Noan genie in an impression from a hard stone seal being used in the 13th century BC at the palace of Nestor. The Griffin warrior's dual role may well explain why he was singled out for special treatment and death when he might have been buried in any of the monumental elite burial chambers nearby. There we go. Uh, what we're showing you here, just to give you an idea of the scale of these graves before Sherry begins to speak, uh, a drone view, and we're just passing over Tholos IV, but those little ants scurrying around the ground were all people involved in the excavation. And we thank Michael Loy of the British School for producing this illustration for us. So I'll turn the uh, stage over to Sherry at this point and move out of the way. Okay. Um, Let me say, if this gets stuck, what's happening is when people come in, it throws our presentation to the background. So you need to hit the track okay. pad to bring it forward. Okay. okay. All right. Yes. In the summer of 2006, we began the process of expropriating a piece of land adjacent to the Palace of Nestor. We had hoped to begin excavations in that plot in 2015 when we received a permit to restart the University of Cincinnati excavations. The purchase of the property, however, was not completed until April of 2018, 12 years after we had initiated the procedures and at the start of the fourth year of our permit. The field is located approximately 100 meters to the northeast of the Palace of Nestor and encompasses the chamber of a monumental Tholos tomb or beehive tomb that was excavated by Lord William Taylor in 1953 as part of Carl Blagan's excavations at the palace. The dome of the Tholos had collapsed in antiquity, causing the entire cavity to become filled with earth until it was flush with the modern surface. Although Taylor found the blocking wall intact, the Tholos had been disturbed in antiquity, probably already in late Mycenaean times. In spite of the episodes of removing and displacing burial goods, Many precious artifacts were recovered, including a gold cushion seal with a depiction of a griffin, a gold signet ring with an image of uh, a, Mycene a Minoan religious scene, including a shrine, and multiple beads in semi-precious stones, including amethyst, agate, carnelian, and um, uh, amber. Fragments of vessels found in the tomb and in the dromos suggested to Blagan that the Tholos was constructed at the beginning of the Late Bronze Age. Reevaluation of the vessels based on their links with Crete and the orthostats used in the Stomian walls, however, suggested to us that the tomb was first used at the end of the Middle Hellatic period. Tholos IV was constructed with small stones and had an unlined earthen dromos. It is one of the earliest Tholos tombs on the Greek mainland 
and has a diameter of 9.35 meters or approximately 30 feet. The dome of the monument was restored to its current state by the Greek Archaeological Service in 1957 and is currently open to the public. Because we received access to the targeted plot of land less than three weeks before the beginning of our field season, we did not have a chance to conduct a geophysical survey before the start of the project. The field had been planted with currents and it needed to be cleared before we could begin. We decided to test the stratigraphy with a series of trenches around the perimeter of the field starting on the east side. And then there were two areas of interest in the middle of the field that we also identified. This strategy was in keeping with our research design and we hope to find evidence for the town around the palace. Most of the trenches proved to be fairly uninteresting. Three areas, however, have yielded exciting results and it is those that I will discuss this evening. In the event, we did not find the town around the palace. Instead, we uncovered the remains of two new monumental Tholos tombs that were used by elite members of society living on the Anglianos Ridge in the formative years of the Mycenaean civilization, roughly 1550 BC to 1400 BC. I will begin by discussing the latest and smallest of the new tombs and then moved to the earlier one. And that's in this area. The excavation of Tholo 7, which is located near the modern Hora Corifacion Road, had an unauspicious beginning. We decided to work there because a pile of stones was visible on the surface of the earth. This proved to be a modern collection of field stones resting on a thin layer of earth as you can see here. Under the pile, we encountered a mass of additional stones that not, did not appear to have any meaningful order. We removed those stones to a depth of one meter in an attempt to determine how deep the deposit went. When, we found, when they were found to continue beyond that, still without any coherence, we changed strategies and put in two long, test trenches in the shape of a cross. It was then that we found the curved walls on all sides that proved to be the outer walls of Atholos. By the, by the end of the 2018 regular season, we had uncovered the Tholos wall along the west side, parts of it on the east side, and the top of the Stomian. During the 2019 field season, we turned to the excavation of the dromos. Part of the farther end of this had been discovered already in 2018 in two of the exploratory trenches. Its excavation proved to be more complicated than anticipated. It now appears that a wide dromos was cut uh, originally with a gentle slope that led into the tholos. The passage was then filled as was customary. When it came time to reopen the tomb, however, for another burial, a new dromos was dug that was narrower and deeper than the original. The two only joined directly in front of the stomia. Bulks were left in the center of the tomb in order to show the stratigraphy, which in this case was very minimal. It appears that the roof of the tomb collapsed and the chamber filled fairly rapidly. There was no evidence for the formation of stable surfaces after the roof collapsed. As in the case of Tholos IV, the external face of the blocking wall was found intact to the level of the modern surface. The internal face, however, was not preserved, nor were the lintel stones in place. It is not certain how high the dome would have originally stood. Tholos IV is considerably smaller than Tholos IV, 
Tholos 7, this one, is considerably smaller than Tholos 4, the one excavated by Blagan, and it has a maximum diameter of just over eight meters. Although this Tholos was ransacked in antiquity, glimpses of the richness of the grave goods originally deposited within it are preserved in the artifacts we have recovered. A gold signet ring depicting two calves and the sheaves of grain was found along the west wall. A blue glass spacer bead consisting of four conjoined tubes and a blue glass Astarte pendant similar to one found at an early tomb at Kakovatos, which is north of Pilos, show that luxury objects were imported from beyond the Aegean. Both of the glass objects likely originated in the Near East. There were also fragments from a Canaanite amphora and numerous stone conuli and beads. Preliminary analysis suggests that the tomb was constructed in the late, late Helladic II period and used until the early, late Helladic III period. Now, turning to Tholos VI. A disturbance was noted in the center of the field during our, our initial examination. For that reason, a trench was established here over what turned out to be the stomion of the larger of the two Tholos tombs. Dead branches had been used to try to disguise modern digging, which was evident by a dark patch of soil uh, that had been recently disturbed. A large fragment of a lintel stone was visible as were a few blocks from the Stomian wall. A croissant wrapper found inside a void under the um, lintel stone dated uh, the disturbance to 2000, 2016 and confirmed our suspicions that somebody had recently tried to explore the remains. Evidence for the use of a backhoe appeared as we went deeper. The large blocks from the Stomian wall helped us to define the orientation of the dromos and hence the tholos. It became clear early on that because the lintel was covering, the lintel covering the entrance was at ground level when we began, we would need to dig down quite a ways to reach the bottom. It was therefore deemed necessary to begin to cut a stairway as we went down, as Taylor had done in Tholos 4. That would be the only safe way to provide access to the interior and to remove the stones and fallen blocks that were within it. We also needed to devise an excavation plan that it would allow us to capture the stratigraphy as we went deeper while at the same time giving all quadrants access to the stairway. We used a system of removable bulks uh, to achieve these ends. The removable bulks were approximately 50 centimeters wide and were excavated to a height of about a meter. They were then drawn, recorded with photogrammetry and removed, which enabled us to document the stratigraphy but also provided unrestrict, unrestricted movement within the trenches. The excavation was begun in the southern half of the tomb. We then moved to the northern half rather than excavating in separate parts. The surface of the tomb was conveniently bisected by a modern field road. A meter wide uh, bulk of this road was left in place and currently forms the central bulk of our excavation. Although a doorway was cut in the middle to provide access to the Northern part. In addition to preserving the stratigraphical information, the bulk also asks as a central support for the multitude of wooden boards that are used to cover the tholos each night. The post-depositional processes are much more elaborate in Tholos 6 than in Tholos 7. The central bulk captures the stratigraphy very well. The different phases of collapse, reuse, and abandonment are 
are definitely recorded here. One can see the initial collapse at the bottom, a darker stratum in the middle that dates to the geometric through the late classical period, and the modern fill that indicates that the tomb was abandoned after the late classical period. I, I want to just put in then a quick note about our methodology before moving on to the finds. All stones removed from the tomb have been kept in piles by trenches and levels. They now cover almost the entirety of the original field. And should anyone ever wish to reconstruct the collapse patterns, they can do so based on these piles. I hope that's someone uh, different. I am, I'm not really interested in doing that, but they're there if you want to, just let me know. Uh, photogrammetric models that document the progress of the excavation are made on a weekly basis or if necessary, more frequently. From the beginning of the excavation in 2015, we dry sieved 100% of the soil removed from the trenches, except for a standard two liter sample that was put aside for flotation, uh, a process that is being undertaken by Tanya Balamoti at the Aristotle University in Thessaloniki. Early on in Tholos IV, however, small pieces of gold foil began to appear in large numbers. Some of these were so small that they could not be detected or collected in regular dry sieving. We therefore instituted a procedure to water sieve all of the soil that was removed from both Tholos tombs, except of course for the flotation sample. This system has become more and more sophisticated over time as increasing volumes of soil need to be processed. On the right is an example of the type of material that is recovered from the wet sieve. Here you can see little bits of gold and there's actually an amber bead in here. Um, so artifacts such as beads and small fragments of gold and organics like human and animal bones and seeds are extracted in the field. The material is then set down to our out of the field works, work facility and dried on screens before processing. On the right is a tiny gold nail that was recently discovered among the, the, um, the wet sieved material. We excavated the dromos uh, to Tholos VI in 2019. It is over 15.5 meters long and over four meters deep. An example of a removable bulk can be seen in the image here. This drone image more or less shows the state of Tholo 6 as we begin our 2021 field season. We are planning to excavate the top part of the central bulk and the Stomian beginning on Monday. The tomb, like the other two, was disturbed already in Mycenaean times. We know that artifacts were moved aside and removed for reuse during each subsequent burial. Many tantalizing clues about the wealth of the material that it contained, however, were left behind. I will present only a few here. On the left is a large amber bead uh, imp imported from the Baltic, the amber was, and on the right is an amethyst bead. We has also recovered fragments from over a dozen large palace style jars. And here's an illustration of, of one of them. Finally, before closing, I want to turn to a special deposit located at the beginning of the Dromos to Tholos VI, which we call the feature. This area was identified in 2018 when rain filtered along the northern wall of an exploratory trench and revealed a few small pieces of gold adjacent to sterile, sterile soil. Further excavation here has uncovered a very dark deposit of earth that is about six meters long. Because it is impossible to piece plot 
every artifact in this deposit due to the, due to the sheer volume of material. We are excavating it with a microgrid of 20 by 20 centimeter squares. The material from the feature dates to a single period at the beginning of the late Helladic 2A period and represents the earliest use of the tholos. On the left is an amber ring and on the right is a gold rosette. These are two examples of the type of material that we've recovered. Here too, there is extensive evidence for imports, not just from Crete, but also from the Near East. We have several examples of early glass spacer beads likely imported from the Levant. More amazing, however, are two unique pendants or earrings that depict the Egyptian goddess Hathor. Although very similar, they are not exactly the same, and I'm only showing you one of them here. Both are incised on one side with the image of the goddess above an elaborate lotus design. The other side has the same decoration in cloisonne, with cells that are inlaid with semi-precious stones and glass. In addition, we have evidence for the production of gold cutouts on the site. These would have been used for funeral shrouds or as attachments. We have recovered from the feature both the actual cutouts, in this case rosettes, and large quantities of thin gold sheet from which they were cut. The Tholos tombs were used by elite members of society for multiple burials over decades or even centuries. We believe that they were used by family groups and are currently conducting ADNA analyses on some of the bones recovered from Blagan's uh, excavations to test this hypothesis. We can now say with certainty that this was the case for some of the chamber tombs that were excavated in the earlier years. New material from our current excavations will be added to supplement those results. In conclusion, since the end of Blagan's excavations at the Palace of Nestor, people have wondered why there was only one Tholos tomb in close proximity to the palace. We now know the answer to that question. There was not just one, but there were several. So rather than finding the town around the Palace of Nestor, our excavations have succeeded in locating the crypts used by the nobility at the beginning of the late Bronze Age, when the foundations of Mycen Mycenaean civilization were being established. The quantity and quality of finds confirm the importance of Pelos during this formative period. The number of fine imported objects attest to the elite's ability to acquire luxury goods and to participate in early late Bronze Age trade networks that extend beyond the Aegean. At this point, I would like to thank all of those who have participated in the Palace of Nestor excavations over these past six years and all of the specialists who have greatly uh, assisted us uh, with their expertise. Thank you very much.